I'm returning to the circuit that we first saw in part one, this simple one transistor amplifier, for the purpose of doing some further experiments and uh, trying to investigate things like frequency response a little further, and also some issues that I just touched on in the uh, first two parts having to do with uh, feedback. As you may recall from those episodes, we left this resistor, that is the emitter resistor, unbypassed. In other words, the voltage that is developed across this resistor is not just the DC bias voltage, but also an AC voltage. And we're going to look at that in a minute in two ways. But I mentioned earlier that sometimes that is bypassed with a capacitor. What I've done is replaced the 100 ohm resistor for purposes of this part with two 47 ohm resistors. And I did that so that we would be able to bypass either all of the emitter resistor or just a part of it. I also have looked at the amplifier at varying voltages. This supply can be a lot of different values. Obviously, if it goes too high and exceeds the breakdown voltage of the transistor, well then the circuit will fail. But as long as you stay below the breakdown voltage of the transistor, this, this voltage can go higher than 15 volts or lower than 15 volts. So in order to investigate that issue first, let me set up to uh, show you the Analog Discovery Network Analyzer again. You notice that there is some fall off at the low end due to the input coupling capacitor and some fall off at the high end due to the limitations of the transistor and the capacitance in the circuit and so on. And you'll notice that the phase response starts out at less than 180 degrees and then goes to 180 degrees for most of the bandpass. Remember this is an inverting amplifier so that means the output is 180 degrees out of phase with the input. And then at higher frequencies the uh, phase begins to exceed 180 degrees and so this is the normal operation at 15 volts. Let me now reduce it down to 10 volts. And you may not be able to notice it, but there is a very slight decrease in gain. Now let's go down to 7 volts. And I did that in the middle of the run. You notice there there's a big difference in the gain. Let's let it finish. And you'll see that the gain has gone down quite a bit. But notice that the phase remains roughly the same. So now I'm going to go down to 5 volts. Now you notice that the gain has dropped completely down here and now it's coming up and you see it shows that there is virtually no gain. In other words, the output is virtually the same as the input. Here is the uh, scope display. The waveform generator is set to a 1 kilohertz sine wave and once again the yellow is channel 1, the input. Notice what's happening to the output. It is producing negative excursions. That is, the transistor is pulling below the 5 volts that it's being supplied now. But when it tries to produce a positive excursion, the, the uh, supply voltage won't allow that. To, to happen. Now I'm going to slowly raise the supply voltage to 6 volts, 7 volts, 8 volts, 9 volts, 10 volts, 11 volts, 12 volts. And you notice that it's only when it gets to about 12 volts that the circuit starts really acting like a, an amplifier, or at least in any linear fashion. Okay, well enough about supply voltage. Let's now look at that uh, resistor in the emitter. You may recall we talked earlier about the fact that if you don't bypass this resistor it produces negative feedback. It reduces the gain of the amplifier. 
What I have now done, as I said, is replaced the 100 ohm resistor with 247 ohm resistors. And right now I have a 10 microfarad capacitor that bypasses that emitter resistance. There is some resistance inside the transistor. It's called the Shockley resistance. And you can't get rid of that. It's there all the time. What you can do, and you can't even bypass it, what you can do is bypass this resistor. Now, for those of you that have done some advanced circuit work, I am aware that you can bootstrap these circuits so that you get rid of a large part of the Shockley resistance, but that's too advanced a topic to go into here. The voltage across this resistor, we need to maintain the voltage for the bias point in, on a DC level, but what we can do is bypass the AC component. But remember that a capacitor has a reactance that varies with frequency. So by putting this, resist, this capacitance across the emitter resistor, we are in effect changing the frequency characteristics of this amplifier. So let's go now look at the network analyzer and see what has happened. Here is what has happened to the frequency and phase response. You may recall that the amplifier used to come up to about 20 dB, which is right here, and then would remain flat all the way across until the transistor's uh, FT took over and it began to decline. But notice what happens at about 1 kilohertz or 100 hertz. At about 100 hertz, the gain begins to go up above 20 dB and keeps going up until it hits a peak of something over 30 dB, about 32 or 33 dB. Then it falls very slightly and remains at about 30 dB or 31 dB all the way out until the high frequency uh, begins to fall off. This is a result of that bypass capacitor. What is happening is the bypass capacitor is beginning to shunt more and more of the emitter resistor. Look at what's happening to the phase response. Remember the phase response used to come down pretty much uh, to here uh, at 180 degrees and then remain about 180 degrees and then out around here it begins to fall off. That's quite different now. Instead, now, the phase response falls for a while. Then, when that bypass capacitor begins to affect the emitter resistance, the gain uh, or the phase actually turns around and goes in the opposite direction for a little while. Then begins to fall to the value of 180 degrees that it normally would have. And then, of course, further out here, it begins to fall off further. These are all due to inserting that capacitor. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing but only shunt half of the emitter resistance. Now I've bypassed half of the emitter resistance. In other words, half of the emitter resistor is being bypassed with a 10 mic capacitor and the other half remains in the circuit to provide negative feedback. You'll notice that once again down below the area where the capacitor affects the circuit, the circuit remains exactly as before. That is, the gain rises to about 20 dB and remains there until that bypass capacitor begins to affect the emitter resistance. At that time, the gain begins to climb. But, instead of climbing to well over 30 dB like it did with the whole emitter resistor bypassed, it only climbs to 25 dB. Then it remains relatively flat out to uh, an area past a megahertz and then falls off. The phase, you notice, also is a little better behaved. There is a slight rise in the phase when the capacitor begins to affect the emitter and then that goes away and it remains relatively 180 degree inverter until the high frequency characteristics take over and the phase begins to fall off. You might ask, how much capacity do I need? I chose 10 microfarads in this case. Would 100 microfarads be better? 
Well, the answer is yes. If you want to lower the low frequency fall off, or another way to put it is, if you want more gain at lower frequencies, then you need to use a bigger capacitor. So how do you determine that kind of thing? Well, one easy way is to use what are called reactance charts. You may have seen this chart earlier in the series. It's taken from the Allied uh, Electronics Data Handbook, which you can download on the internet. So this is 10 microfarads. Now, what are these two lines? Well, this line here is the 10% line. What I mean by that is, if you're bypassing a 100 ohm resistor and you want to bypass 90%, or in other words, you only want to leave 10% at a particular frequency, you're looking for a capacitor of 10 ohms. In other words, 10% of the resistor you're bypassing. Then if you run a line from that 10 ohms through 10 microfarads, you see that your, the frequency response at which that you will be affecting the output by only 10% is about 1.5 kilocycles. On the other hand, if you want 1%, in other words, if you want to bypass 99%, at 10 microfarads. You're only going to get about 15 or 16 kilocycles of bypass at 1%. Every circuit designer has to make some of these choices and I chose 10 microfarads largely because I'm just simply illustrating the effect of bypassing that emitter resistor which is in effect the feedback resistor. Now I've removed the bypass capacitor I've turned off the network analyzer. I've turned on the wave gen to put a 1 kilohertz signal into the amplifier. And I've moved channel 2, that is the blue trace, from the output of the amplifier to the emitter of the amplifier. So what you're seeing is the input signal, the yellow. The two channels are set to the same gain. 200 millivolts per division. So this is the input signal and following along in phase is the emitter voltage. Now in order to get the two traces to overlap I had to set an offset on the uh, analog discovery to make up for the emitter bias voltage which is about 0.68 volts or about 680 millivolts. So over here, the offset on uh, channel 2 is set to minus 680 millivolts. That causes the two traces to lie on top of one another. Now, what I'm going to do, this is the, emit, the normal emitter current or emitter voltage. Now I'm going to remove the connection to the collector of the transistor. And the reason I do that is to show you that now you, none of the collector current is flowing through the emitter, only the base current. You remember that the, the model, there's a diode, the base to emitter diode. And the signal is coming through, but when the signal goes to uh, zero volts, the diode blocks the negative excursion. In fact, when it gets down to about five-tenths of a volt, it blocks it. But when the signal is above that, the signal comes through. And why am I showing you this? Because this is the part of the emitter current that is due to the input alone. Now let me restore the collector. And this is the total emitter current. My point is that the emitter current due to the input is out of phase with the emitter or the collector current and therefore it actually cancels a small part of the input. This is the source of that negative feedback that we've been talking about. 
Now there is another form of negative feedback that one of the viewers suggested I look at and that is the effect of the base to collector capacitance. Here we've been talking about primarily the emitter resistance and the bypass capacitor. A transistor contains a number of what are called parasitic elements. A parasitic means something just like a parasite on a tree. It's something that is there and you really can't get rid of it. You'd like to minimize its impact. And one of those parasitics is the fact that this base and this collector form a small capacitor that effectively couples a little bit of the collector voltage back to the base. Now, at low frequencies, that capacitor is of not much consequence because it's a fairly small capacitance. You can't get rid of it completely. What you can do is higher frequency transistors minimize that capacitance. The high frequency response is often dominated by that capacitance. And the reason is that that capacitance is multiplied by the voltage gain of the stage. We'll look at this in a minute. It's called the Miller effect. That is, suppose that you have a 10 picofarad capacitor between the collector and the base. If you do, the high frequency response will not be affected by 10 picofarads. It will be affected as though, if this stage gain is 10, as though you had 100 picofarads. In other words, the 10 picofarads that's physically there is multiplied by the voltage gain of the state. Let's look at that. Remember we saw earlier that this circuit begins to fall off a little above a megahertz. What we're going to do is we're going to insert a, a little extra capacity from the collector to the base and see what happens to the frequency response. I've reinserted the bypass capacitor in the emitter, which is why the gain goes up. And I have also inserted a feedback capacitor from base to collector, which is why the gain falls off quicker. What I'm now going to do is remove the emitter bypass capacitor, but look at what happened to the frequency response. You recall earlier the frequency response was out to here. Now it's moved back to here. The phase response is, is going back to fairly normal until you get out quite a ways. Now let me remove that Miller capacitor. All of a sudden we have band pass out beyond 3 megahertz again. This is the effect of what is called the Miller capacitor. All transistors have a Miller capacitor, that is a small amount of capacitance between base and collector. If you use a transistor as a voltage multiplier, that voltage multiplier will also multiply the effect of the base to collector capacitance. It's what's called the Miller effect. And in high frequency amplifiers, it can be the dominating factor. And before I close, I want to thank the viewer for the suggestion to include uh, these issues, or at least some of them, in a part three. And I hope that you have enjoyed this series. I don't plan to revisit transistor amplifiers, at least not at the basic level, anytime soon. but. I do hope you've enjoyed things and I hope you'll look forward to perhaps some more videos, but probably on some other uh, topics. Anyway, in the meantime, have a nice day.